Bonjour, mon ami. How are you doing in New Zealand? Bonjour. Really great. It's nice to be down under, and as you can read from the news, uh, pretty good overall. Oh, did I see New Zealand? You are uh, in New Zealand. And yes, we, uh, we use word down under New Zealand as well. <laughs> we borrow from each other. Both countries borrow from each other. We debate who invented Pavlova, Pavlova cake, whether it's Australia or New Zealand, who's better at rugby, the list goes on. Now, I, know, I know the feeling with hockey, but the trueness is that you're Canadian. I am. I'm from Montreal. Nope. And you and I both were at McGill University a number of years apart. Uh, and we connected several years ago, I think probably through LinkedIn of all places. And then uh, went from there. Yeah. Well, you know, um, good friends are um, are good to find. Let's put it that okay. way. So um, you can be far, but you can still be together, right? Completely agree. So let's start. Um, <laughs> this is Henri, the sequel, I guess we would call it. And it will uh, be several years later. <laughs> exactly. Can you um, just tell people who you are and a, a brief background? That'd be great. No oh, pleasure. So my name's Henri Elliott. I've been in New Zealand almost 18 years. Uh, we raised our children here with my wife. She's a sixth generation New Zealander and our youngest is a seventh generation. And the other son is a second generation Canadian born in Toronto. I was born in Montreal. He was born in Toronto. So we keep the, the politics in, in Canada uh, neutral that way. Um, I'm the founder of a company called Board Dynamics and I still run it day to day. And we've been around over 11 years and we're focused on building better boards in New Zealand and Australia for lots of companies from public to private to crown government agencies and entities. And it never gets to be that you're bored, right? I love that. It's funny. I got quoted the other day saying, we want to make sure that boards are not bored and they add value. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I forget bored. That's for sure. And I lecture on corporate governance as well. And I've written a book called Board Shorts that came out two years ago and available on Amazon. There's my plug. I love it. <laughs> well, we're, this won't be a boring interview, I guarantee you. Um, tell me, um, we all talk about our whys and our purpose, but I love asking this question. Why do you do what you do? I do what I do because I'm passionate about building better boards for a better future. And that sounds like a cliche, but it's not. Corporate governance for all types of organizations has been pretty average for a long time. And a lot of gray occurs and a lot of people who are not experienced and most boards traditionally have been a, have appointed accountants and lawyers, possibly because they're the ones they knew and they were advising them already. So why don't you have a seat around the table? But board composition is more about adding value from different sectors and fields. And as the world's changed, the old historical companies we saw 100 years ago don't exist today. And we have a new wave of new and emerging businesses that need a different skill set of directors. and that's why I do what I do. And if you don't have a good governance model, you probably will not have a sustainable business. And that's why I care. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, this, um, I, I've found that um, it's taken a long time for corporate leaders, board leaders, whatever, to realize that aligning with social impact is a good idea for their business. And not to mention the only way you'll attract the top talent these days is to be leaders who care about what's going on. And what you, what you talk about there is really, is really interesting because I had this conversation with a um, senior executive at a big um, cannabis company, actually, where we talk about this all the time. It's changing in the sense that it doesn't have to be just CEOs on the board, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about experiences, as not as much about years of experience or what, or what title you have, but about real experiences um, to match on boards, correct? It's very true. The experience has to be relevant. It has to be current. And you want future focused people around the table. They don't live in the past and they're thinking ahead. And they, even though they're technically part time, they have to think about the organization in a full time manner at different stages of the day, week and month. And also be prepared to roll up their sleeves during a crisis like we're experiencing now. That boards will be more, meet more often via Zoom and technology. And the last thing I would always note is be self-aware. If you're not adding value anymore, it's time to go. We don't want boring boards, do we? <laughs> There's a movie. We don't want boring boards. <laughs> That's what happens when you live in LA. Everybody thinks, well, oh, movie, TV show. Um, That's right. I'll do a little pitch now for 30, 30 seconds. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, with respect to that, uh, but aligning with social impact, um, for all the reasons we said, 
and I always say this is kind of like a push question because it's talking about you. Um, what differentiates you in your mind um, as a leader who cares? That's a great question. I think the first thing is, and I wore this t-shirt on purpose. Nice. <laughs> the first thing is I've always been known as someone who's nice and reasonably self-aware and more self-aware now since I've been married a long time. That's what my wife is really good at reminding me of. I think the second one is I view sincere networking. So I care about people. And the other one is mentoring the next generation and even mentoring people even older than me. So it works both ways. Um, a lot of people just need help and a lending ear to help pivot what they do, their career, but also lead by example you know, roll up your sleeves as required. So, you know, if you're running an organization, make sure you meet everyone at different stages of your week, your month, your year. And it's not about being an undercover boss. It's actually about showing that you care about them as a person. And the second thing is, is that if they're going through a hard time, how can you help them, whether it's personal or at work? And last but not least, the safety of people. And a lot of businesses took a huge step to either close temporarily or continue, and or continue to pay people during this time. So it's not always about money. I think there's a revisit of what capitalism is today and profit maximization does not work in isolation. Without good people, you won't have a business nor will you have any customers. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's so right. And I, I, when we trademarked the term leaders who care, it was because I think leaders finally realized that people want to go work or be on boards where the leaders do care about what you're talking about. Um, and you said it before we got on, on, the, um, on the video, um, life's short. You know, yes. you want to enjoy, you want to make an impact, you want to do something, you know, unless you're forced to, um, which some people unfortunately are to make money, you, you want to be on something that you can, you can make a difference in it and enjoy it. So the other aspect of that is, and I'm sure your grandparents and other grandparents have said this before too, is but mine would say it with a Kiev accent from Russia, they'd say, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing, right? Um, then they say, and education, but the health, and they, it wasn't a line. They, they meant it because they knew what hard work was. They knew that was the whole ball game. So here we are, technology zooming along still even more. COVID, the pandemic is like crazy what it's impacting. Mm -hmm. Then you got everything about, and rightly so, um, racial racism, social justice, all these grilling things. It's a lot of things going on. And we've had more time, maybe this awakening, if you want to call it that, to, to think. So what I want to ask you with all that in mind, how do you view the future in the sense of our awareness at work, our awareness at, at home and in, and in the community? No, that's a, that's a great question. And it's probably a very long answer, but I'll give a short one. I think you have to look at several facets. One is how we work today. I know you work from home regularly. I think about the workplace. Do we actually require everyone to be in the office at the same time? Do we need to be commuting and traveling? That obviously has an impact on the roads. Like for example, in New Zealand, during our lock-in over the almost three months, obviously there was no cars on the road, bar essential services. Everyone was walking, everyone was outside, we were chatting, but we went back to our homes to work where we could. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it's a, a greater solution that we've worked in the past. We don't need to be seen in the office to be successful. I think I think back at my career, you know, 20 years ago, I stayed in the office late at night, probably just staring at a screen, but my boss hadn't left. So therefore, once he left, I left the door, left fall of 10 minutes later. And I'd be there for three, four hours until 10 o'clock at night when I could have left at six or five or even worked from home that afternoon, probably got more done than in the office being distracted by colleagues to have a coffee or a chat at the water cooler, a bit of a cliche. I think the other thing to note as well is that different generations now want different things from their lives. I think, you know, one generation grew up, you know, very conservative. You went to work, you went home, you had your weekend and that you started the nine to five. Today, the generations and probably because of the changing nature of companies, want flexibility. You know, I think about the use of technology, and I think there was a great advert years ago, I think it might have even been Cisco, where there was a conference call between five countries, they all spoke different languages, the AI was translating it into one common language for everyone to understand, or back to their original language. One person was on a mountain bike on a hill in California, the other one was in Moscow, another one was in New York, another one was in London, another one was in Sydney, and it was solving a customer technical issue on a product 
and it got resolved. And then you it, it fast forwarded to a mum with her son and a robotic dog barking at the son, do your homework. <laughs> and mum saying, thank you so much for helping me. And, and it was a call center person dealing with this all behind the scenes and, and, and it, it, no one knew any better. And that's how we actually are working today more and more. And I think the last comment to make, I think around health, technology is helping us live a better life. You know, even with the lock-in, you know, we were doing exercise classes via video. Um, we were actually outdoors where we could. And last but not least, through education, we're eating better. You know, we're trying to avoid processed food. The challenge like anything else is that we want to make sure we can take care of people of all various socioeconomic backgrounds and whatever health challenges they have. So as a society and as a leader, we have to care about them and never operate in isolation. Because I'll view my life as privileged and lucky, may have worked hard and continue to work hard, others may not have those advantages. So we have to look at the big picture as well as, as an individual and your team at work. Yeah, that, that, that's brilliant. Um, it kind of segues a little bit definitely into the role that business leaders, business leaders who care have to play now with respect to well-being in a much bigger picture. The financial well-being has to be there, the physical well-being has to be there, and the mental well-being has to be there. I'd like you to comment more about that, but also in the sense of that it's actually good for business to care about the well-being for talent. And it does, by osmosis, go into the community, does it not? It does. So if you think about, firstly, the role of the board and working with the CEO or you know, president of a company, you want the, the role to understand what the values of the organization and there's alignment there. From that, you want the organization to clearly communicate what the values are, top down and, and down up as well. From bottom up, I mean, because it's important that people buy into it and they believe what's occurring. You know, some great examples in the media of companies like Patagonia that you think, wow, that they've done an amazing job and they haven't focused on how much money can we make? Can we actually potentially, we may lose money for a little while, but our people will be more loyal as a result and will take care of their health. So if you think of the triangle of, of health and you think of money and you think of happiness, they all go together. You're happy if you have money to feed yourself. If you have your health, then you'll have a life. And then you have to think fondly overall out of all that is get an understanding for how do you help people retrain and retool, as I said earlier, but also recognize that sometimes people will have to change jobs. It may not be you helping them, but you help them through that transition. I'll actually add a quick little bonus thought as well. I'm thinking about it now as we're chatting, mm -hmm. is that I think honesty is critical. And I think often we're not honest because we're nervous about the legal consequences. Well, I think there's a balancing act in how we actually work through that potentially in society today. And if I think at the more recent you know, court rulings around you know, discrimination, well, I'm even surprised it ends up in the Supreme Court. It should be something that we wouldn't even need a court system for because it's common sense that we all share the basic set of shared values of honesty, integrity, and respect for each other. And that shouldn't even be debatable. It'd be more like, do we have the right strategy? How do we fix the business model? You know, do we, if we shrink in size, need fewer people? Are there other businesses we can create for those employees? Or can we help those employees for their next job? And that's how you think about even a circular economy for people. Yeah, it's, it's so cool to hear you say that. You know, I compare a lot of things to sports and uh, the, the, the way to lose a return on investment on, on, a, on a, an athlete or an employee right, is if uh, they make a mistake and you get rid of them or you're pissed at them or whatnot, rather than just tell them the truth of what happened and get them back on the ice, if you will, or the field or in the office. And uh, people, the thing I always found out through studies is the number one thing that fills our hearts and souls is belonging somewhere. And that feeling is, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it keeps us away from being lonely. It keeps us fulfilled. It keeps us so many things. And and I'm sure you'd agree with this during COVID and whatnot, the, the leaders and their companies that are going to win big are the ones that tried everything possible to keep people, whether it meant cutting hours for some and keeping the others, whether it meant whatever new training or whatnot, it might've cost them, but the return on investment is probably going to be spectacular. You're right. Because what will happen if they don't do that, the brand value will be decimated customers will think, well, I don't want to use that service because what I've read in the media, or I know people who were impacted and they weren't treated with respect and they didn't do everything possible to retain their staff. So I'll probably start using someone else. 
Right. Competitors will look at that and use that as competitive advantage. And I think what I also would note, which is interesting in our conversation, is that I think this is a period in history that none of us have ever witnessed, you know, whether you want to say it's once in a hundred year experience. As we were chatting before the video, it's something that the world probably needed. And it sounds a bit cruel to say that, but as a planet, we probably needed the time to go, you know what, for sustainability based on climate risk, you know what, there's something going on here that's a big wake up call. And I hope following getting through COVID-19 at a minimum a cure, I think a vaccine is challenging, but I think definitely a cure that, you know, we can eliminate or at least reduce it to such a small amount of potential deaths or risk to people's lives is that we rethink how we actually live on this planet and take care of it better. Because as you said to me earlier, mother nature is teaching us a lesson here. So let's be kinder, nicer to our planet as we are to our people. And as we operate businesses, let's improve what we have and not go back to our bad habits post COVID-19 It's something critical to think about too. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, as they say, it, it takes less muscles to smile than to frown. So it's <laughs> actually not that hard to do if we, if we really look at what's important. Um, two quick, two quick little questions before we conclude this part is, um, if you could make one dramatic change, what would it be? Um, for me as an individual or for the organization? No, not even the organization, but just, out there, I mean, what's happening right now? If you could make one dramatic change, yeah, I, I, I think the one dramatic change I would make is we and it almost have a universal social benefit or, or safety net system in place around the world. Um, I think we need to rethink universal health care, but also how do we think about the minimum wage that people can actually live a quality life in respect to a roof over their head food on the table, and a little bit of discretionary spending to go watch a movie, Netflix, or ride a bicycle. In other words, and here's my sports thing again, I never understood as a kid when media said, this team won the trade, that team lost that trade. And I said, why should you lose a trade? It doesn't make sense. You're in one league, and mm -hmm. if one team is, is beating everybody, how valuable is that championship if the league sucks, right? Um, 100%. It sounds, that's what you're talking about. We are one community. Um, it's not that complicated, but it's actually, um, it's not that simple, but it, it, it can happen, so. I think it's about team versus I. Right. So, you know, it's us versus I. And, and as a community, I saw people coming together during this. Obviously now people are not happy, and that's another conversation for another time, but I think it's important that we actually focus on the positive of this, which is, hard to see possibly but how can we actually change how we work as a society and not focus just on making money but using money more effectively to help everybody as long as we create a good balance around that and it's fair and equitable sounds like a good fair place to conclude this part man um you're the best merci beaucoup mon ami un grand plaisir i'd love to chat to you mark take care you too